I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to you one of Mexico's national treasures, Elena Poniatowska. Um, she is a national treasure not just because her writing is so cherished in Mexico, but because she has spent so many years documenting and engaging with Mexican culture and society in entirely unique ways, I think. She has been a participant observer and also a creative force. Her novels, in particular the bestseller Tinisima, uh, which was about the life of the photographer Tina Morotti, photographer and revolutionary, no less, and her new book, which we'll talk about today, about the visionary and rebellious uh, British painter, in fact, Leonora Carrington, called Leonora. Um, these books have all reimagined the lives of charismatic and gifted women. But she has also had a twin career as a documentarian, capturing the very real voices of Mexican people at times of trauma, the earthquake of 1985, for instance, or the student massacre at Tlatelolco, in 1968, her very famous book, La Noche de Tlatelolco, translated as Massacre in Mexico, I think, is now especially a book that we should all be turning to in the light of recent events in Ayotzinapa. Its echoes are even more resounding. So I'd like you to welcome very warmly Elena Poniatowska. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, before we start, I would like to acknowledge the death of Eduardo Galeano, the very extraordinary uh, Uruguayan writer, and also, of course, Gunter Grass. But, uh, and before we start also, I would love to give you, but I'm going to stand up to give you the names of the 43 boys the students that have disappeared in Mexico and their parents are looking for them and they've disappeared ever since the 26th of September. And their names are Luis Angel uh, Abarca Carrillo, Marco Antonio Gomez Molina, Raul Bruno Garcia. And their ages come, go from age 17 to age 25 and also uh, Jorge Antonio Tizapa, Legideño, and Abel García Hernández, Carlos Lorenzo, who was called El Frijolito, Hernández Muñoz, Adán Abraham de la Cruz, Felipe Arnulfo, Rosa Campesino, Emiliano Allen Gaspar de la Cruz, El Pilas, César Manuel González Hernández, Jorge Álvarez Nava, José Eduardo Bartolo, eh, eh, Israel Jacinto Lugardo, que llamaban el chiquito porque era, because he was small, Antonio Santana eh, Maestro, Cristian Tomás Colón Garnica, Luis Ángel Francisco Arzola, Miguel Ángel Mendoza Zacarías, Benjamín Asencio Bautista, El Comelón, because he ate a lot, Alexander Mora Venancia, Leonel Castro Abarca, Everardo Rodríguez Bello, Dorian González Parral, Jorge Luis González Parral, his brother, Marcial Pablo Baranda, Jorge Aníbal Cruz Mendoza, Abelardo Vázquez Penitén, Cuthberto Ortiz Ramos, Bernardo Flores Alcaraz, Jesús Giovanni Rodríguez, Mauricio Ortega Valerio, Martín Gesemani Sánchez García, Magdaleno Rubén Lauro Villegas, Giovanni Galindo Guerrero, José Luis Luna Torres, Julio César López Partolizín, Jonás Trujillo González, Miguel Ángel Hernández Martínez, Cristian Alfonso Rodríguez, José Ángel Navarrete González, Carlos Iván Ramírez Villarreal, José Ángel Campo Cantor y finalmente el 43 avo que es Israel Caballero Sánchez. A little moment there. Um, 
that's a horrifically long list. Perhaps we should reverse the order of our conversation. We thought we might sto start by talking about Leonora, but maybe you should tell us a little bit about your views on Ayotzinapa and what should be done now. Well, we are fighting the people who want to fight. We are fighting to see uh, it helping the parents. The parents are traveling, and we're going to see what is happening. There is a very extraordinary priest in Mexico. You probably have heard about him, Alejandro Solalinde, who was a, he, he took care of the migrants from Central America, and he helped them. And maybe, uh, I was told that he had been stopped both by Obama and uh, uh, Peña Nieto. And stopped? Stopped, yes. But I don't know. I don't know. I have to go be, to be back in Mexico in order to find out about this. And mm. um, are you going to write about it? Are you going to be writing about it? Oh, yes. I've, ri I've been writing about it. Yeah. Yes. A book, though. Well, not a book, but, not a book, but I, do, I, I am helping young people to write a book about this. Young girls, not girls, but young journalists who are going every day to Ayotzinapa and working there and seeing the peasants, the peasant, the, the parents uh, have a stick in their hand and they stick it in the earth and when it smells funny, it has a funny smell, they know there's a body there. Mm -hmm. That's right, this search for the bodies is an they, extraordinary That's the way they quest. do it, oh, yes. They're sort of bars, aren't they? Almost like you use on scaffolding, um, metal bars, right? Yes, this is, this is the way they're doing it, and it's uh, a ver very personal and a very, of course, a very, maybe it's a very powerful also mm -hmm. way of doing it, although it's so painful, and, and besides, they do it, of course, with no help from the government. Mm, of course. What do you think the echoes are, in fact, of that night in Tlatelolco, on where we are now? Well, I think Tlatelolco uh, was in a year that was very important for the world. It was 1968, it was the Black Panthers, it was the death of the President of the United States of, uh, and his brother, Kennedy. It was a death, uh, it was a change in the world, and I think boys and girls were asking, what, uh, what, uh, what earth are you giving us, no? What are you giving us? What is our heritage, no? What are you inheriting us? It was against the war of Vietnam, it, it was of course the, the, um, um, this wonderful singer, and, uh, they uh, boys with their hands like this, yeah. their, and their fingers up like this, saying they were not, uh, they wouldn't go to Vietnam. So, it, uh, but it, I think for Mexico, it wasn't nearly. There were student movements in the world, but the only country where students were murdered and killed was Mexico. Mm. <laughs> and it was also the year of the Olympics. No? It in was Mexico. the year of the Olympics. No, so I, I, I believe it, this was the reason that the government was so afraid that the, this movement would sabotage the Olympics. Mm. And you went out that night or the following morning you went out and you started collecting. The, the book is an incredible document of uh, a sort of almost a collage of documents, of testimonies, right? Of people that you found. Yes, people speaking about their laws. Uh, Tlaltelolco is uh, like a city, a little city, in the middle of this huge, enormous city, which is Mexico. And the people that saw the, the well, the massacre, they all gave their, t m many of them were m very afraid to speak out because uh, many of them had been, many of the, w had been taken by the soldiers and put in jail. So it was really, it was, uh, well, it was a, really a very sad moment of our, in the history of our country, no? Have you been afraid to speak out? Have I been afraid to speak out? No, I, I've been always very lucky. I think I have a, 
a huge guardian angel as tall and enormous as this building because, uh, I don't know, nothing happens. Well, of course, the government doesn't, doesn't care, doesn't like me. <laughs> Well, you've refused government awards, haven't you? You've turned them down. Every time they try and give you a prize, you say, why should I have a prize for this? Yes, because they wanted to give me a prize for this book. And I said, who's going to give a prize to the dead, no? Yes. And now, in Mexico, journalists in particular are very threatened. Are you concerned about that? About the threats to journalists in Mexico? Yes, it's a, Mexico is a very, very dangerous country for journalists. It is a dangerous country as a whole, but for journalists it is more so. And of course, uh, even uh, young people have been, even very young journalists have been disappeared, especially at the border with the United States because of the drug business, no? And everyone at the border uh, knows the other one and it's very easy to eliminate. Mm. Should we switch and talk about Leonora Carrington? Uh, yes, of course <laughs> we can switch about Leonora. Um, I'm interested also in your own life. You've got this incredible past and your parents also were perhaps her generation. Is that right? I mean, you, she left, she left Europe in, during the war. You also left Europe during the war, but you yes. knew her. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how the book began and your encounters with her. Well, uh, Leonora was the best kept secret in Mexico because she was a very private person, a very lovely, beautiful woman, and she, uh, she hated journalists. Uh, every time someone came to visit her and wanted to see her, she used to say, oh, what a bloody nuisance. <laughs> she hated people to come in and ask questions. But she, as we had so more or less the same background, as you just said, she was always very nice to me because she illustrated uh, my first book, which is called Lilus Kikos. Mm -hmm. And she did the drawings about nuns. And the, the story is... Uh, uh, well, it's a funny story. No, not that so funny, but it's a story. So she illustrated it, and she uh, she was quite. Uh, so we became friends, but I didn't see her much while she was uh, working for a long time, and she was a friend of Edward James, and she and she painted. Of course, she painted for her living, really. I didn't see her, but I, when I met her again, she was old. And she's more or less lonely as old age is. So uh, as I went to see her, uh, she spoke to me about her life, about horses, about England, and about her mother and father, Harold Carrington. So I never took a note because she hated it. And of course, I, I couldn't have any of this, uh, a recorder, yeah. this new technology or any kind of technology except the technology in here. So uh, I, I did the book when I came back home at night. I used to write uh, very quickly what she had told me and that's how I could do the book, yes. Mm. Can you describe for those who aren't familiar with it, her paintings? Because um, I don't know how well known she is. There is an exhibition at Tate Liverpool just now of yes. her work. Well, it's really very surprising that and it's really a mystery that she's not known here mm -hmm. because she's the last surrealist woman in the whole world. She was Max Ernst's lover and then she, and she learned a lot from him. And then she was uh, shown by Peggy Guggenheim in New York and she suddenly, I don't know how she did it or why she did it, but maybe she fell in love with a Mexican poet, Renato Leduc, uh, uh, who was in New York at the time, and uh, it took her to Mexico. And then she stayed in Mexico all her life. She died in Mexico. She didn't even, she didn't like Mexico too much. But Edward James arrived, he was an original, and he did a very extraordinary, uh, 
I think he bought a piece of land in Gilitla, in San Luis Potosí, where all the drug is now. Oh. And he, yes, there are always people with guns everywhere. And he did a beautiful, extraordinary garden uh, that has uh, staircases that go nowhere and balconies to nowhere. They stand like this in the air. And, uh, and she did a painting for him, of course, because he was, he was really, uh, how do you say it, his, her benefit. A, a benefactor, no, he really helped her. He was the first one to sell, uh, to I mean, to buy her paintings. And she even had a fight with him because he wanted to have five paintings or ten, I don't know how many paintings for a very low price. So she said, you can't come again to my house if you do this to me. So <laughs> she was a very brave woman in many ways a very special, extraordinary human being. Mm. Yes. And you you know, I was in Mexico just recently and I saw a photograph, there's an exhibition of a, a Western Modotti um, exhibition, uh, obviously your subject, but there was a photograph in the show of your mother as a young girl. Can you tell us a bit about that background, your own background? Yes, because uh, Western took Besides the, f the, the photographs that really interested him in Mexico, his very good photographs, uh, he had uh, clients, so he had a, he had a photograph, sh a studio. Photoshop, no? Mm -hmm. so, and so he took, uh, he took uh, pictures of my mother and my, mother, uh, my mother's sister, and he complained about them because they <laughs> changed their appointment. Uh, he, and he wrote in his day books, all oh, the Amor sisters uh, said they couldn't come today because they hadn't washed their hair. <laughs> so I suppose he disliked them a lot, but he took a very lovely picture of my mother when she was about 15. Mm. And she looks very clean, she has very clean hair. <laughs> <laughs> so your mother moved to Europe and then brought you back, is that right, during the war? My mother, my mother was Mexican. Yes. My mother was really Mexican, but she was a Mexican that, uh, a reactionary Mexican that went, because of the revolution, she lived uh, first in Biarritz and then in Paris, and she married a Polish man, yeah. and then afterwards, she came back to Mexico. She suddenly remembered. I didn't even know my mother was Mexican until I was 10 years old. She never even mentioned Mexico. And I had an American grandmother whose name was Elizabeth Crocker Sperry. And she hated my mother too, because she took, really took very good care of us because my mother during the war, she was driving an ambulance. So she took care of us, and I remember every night she had my sister and I sit next to her, one on this side, the other one on the other side, and, re and she read the National Geographic magazine, and then she showed us women and men that had bones in their heads like that, and breasts like this, and she would say, you see, children, this is Mexico. <laughs> So we were very afraid of coming to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes. Um, and so how did your politics evolve after that, quite different from your families? I think uh, politics, uh, I think Mexico touched me a lot as a girl because I saw people in the streets without shoes. And this never happened in France. And then people that didn't want to be looked at, they went, they went like this, they covered their faces with a rebozo. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised and very taken by their mystery. Who, they, who were they? Why did they do this? Why did they? Uh, and I think I identified with them much more than with politicians or the other Mexicans that thought very highly of themselves. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and then you went on to give them a voice. I mean, you know, some of these people who nobody was paying attention, you made that part of your career, right? Yes, to speak to them, listen to them. And it was a great gift they gave me. It was very wonderful because I had one advantage. I was very short. I am very short. 
and uh, no one sees me. So I could get into multitudes and into houses and people confided and they told me their story. So this made everything so easy. <laughs> That's yes. a great trick. What? <laughs> That's a great trick. It's a great trick. If I had been a, a tall, beautiful woman, I mean a blonde woman like this, <laughs> they would have hated me, I suppose. <laughs> I need to um, let you have some time to ask questions, but can you just very quickly tell us how um, you decided to write fiction and non-fiction separately? I mean, one is very imaginative, even when it concerns stories that you could be telling in fact, right? And the other is very documentary. I mean, how do you divide those two but genres? I sort of mix everything. Right. I sort of, uh, yes, because I think that uh, people, when they write about themselves, they are always writing their biographies, no? Mm -hmm. Really, they're always, uh, people are centered usually on themselves, no? Mm -hmm. And journalists uh, have this great advantage. They're supposed to find what others, w others want and what others think. So it's a great advantage. And when you make it part of your, I suppose your heart, or whatever it is, uh, then you go ahead and you do, some, some, uh, something that is different, no? Mm. No? But of course, writers, real good, very real writers, they say, oh, you're a journalist, or you're just a journalist. <laughs> and journalists, they really say that, they, they really think that you are on their side. They do? They, okay. of, of course, good. they do. The Mexicans, of course, they do. Good, at least it's not both, you know, everybody's saying you're something else. Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for now. This is very brief. It's ridiculously brief, but I should let you ask questions if you have one. Yes, go ahead. So, uh, oh, thank you. There is a microphone. Oh yes, hello. Um, I want to thank this conversation, the speaker, and to congratulate Miss Poniatowska for all the things he she does in Mexico and for the Mexicans. And I want to ask why you never write in an international newspaper to be the voice of Mexico in international point of view, like, I don't know, The Guardian or The New York Times, or to have a column each week or one per month. It was a personal choice or a political situation? I don't Thanks. think uh, it isn't a personal choice, of course, uh, but I think that Mexico only appears in the Guardian, I'm perhaps not in the Guardian because the Guardian has an eye on Mexico, but only appears uh, when there's a tragedy, you know, an earthquake or a killing. So I hope we don't appear too much. And uh, I, I don't think uh, Mexico has ever been asked to be speaking. Of course, there are some Mexicans that are very famous. Frida Kahlo is always in the international newspapers. She's a <laughs> symbol of Mexico, like the Virgin of Guadalupe. She's more or less the same than the Virgin of Guadalupe. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, thank you. Is there another question we should be taking? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I admire about your writing is the way that you give voice to women and who I think were often very silent when you first started. Can you tell us something about the problems you might have had when you first started writing in being accepted as a woman writer or didn't have? Well, it was very difficult to be, it was difficult in Mexico to start doing it as a woman being a journalist because they used to think that la, la mujer con la pata rota, como la escopeta, the, the, the woman should be inside and you should break her leg. So it was uh, difficult at the beginning, especially when I started. I started in 1953 when no one here was born, I suppose. So uh, uh, it, it was hard, but uh, if you, they always, they used to say, that women used to work because uh, mientras me caso, b while I'm getting married. So they were, yeah, mientras me caso. And uh, 
or maybe they thought that a, a woman that was there because she wanted to marry a journalist, but to marry a journalist is the worst thing I think that can happen <laughs> to a woman, no? Because journalists are always saying they are on a, some kind of a uh, an expedition. Sometimes they're not in an expedition. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why it, it, it was hard. But now uh, journali uh, journals in Mexico, they're, they're filled with women, very wonderful and honest women. They are more, uh, they are, uh, they are better than men. In the fact, they're so honest. And we have a very wonderful Carmen Aristegui, mm. uh, a very wonderful woman in television and radio, and she's very brave. And she of course, she has job. to pay the consequences mm. because she was just kicked out. That's right. Yeah, one more question just in the front, sir. Hello, it's Elizabeth Mistry, the former Mexico correspondent for The Independent. And I can remind you, Elena, that we've spoken in the past and I've put Mexico in sometimes when there wasn't a tragedy. Um, I would like to ask about Carmen Aristegui, who, if anyone doesn't know, was basically run out of her job for, uh, for publishing real news. Uh, Elena, what do you feel about the precedent that has been set regarding the treatment of Carmen Aristegui, and what would you like to see happen in the future? Well, I would like many uh, Carmen Aristegui's to be able to work in Mexico, especially. Uh, she, I think she was mainly uh, 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 expelled from her work because she denounced the fact of a White House, uh, the White House bought by the president's wife or the president for $7 million. And imagine not even Jane Fonda or the greatest, uh, the, uh, the, uh, La Gaviota, her name, she said that she had earned that money uh, while she was a, a movie actress. But many great American, and especially, especially American women, uh, the, uh, like Meryl Streep, for instance, she would never have won anything as, as a, and be, be able to buy a seven million house, the uh, dollar house. I'm sorry about my English. Sometimes it makes something in here. Yes. I should have answered in Spanish. Yes. <laughs> but, but that answers your question about what should happen in future. Or Quieres ver a, a Carmen trabajando otra vez en, eh, en México y en dónde, en qué forro? Yo creo que ella va a tener que crear su propio medio. Okay, uh, su Elena medio is de saying that she would like Carmen, who is the journalist, to have her own uh, her own media outlet. Yes, and we are oh. all uh, cooperating and fighting for her to have her own media Thank because you very this much. is a great a great injustice. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another question? We have time for one more, I think. Yes, one at the back. Hi, Elena. I'm Ricardo from Guadalajara. Uh, what do you think about the death of uh, Eduardo Galeano and uh, his voice for Latin America? Well, I think it's a great loss for Latin America because I think his book, Las Venas Abiertas, the America Latina is a very important, it's like a Bible for Latin America. And I think that he, he wrote very uh, short stories, very short testimonies about people speaking about the earth, the way they worked, uh, the way they loved, the way they, they died, of course. And I think this book, uh, his books have been uh, very important to Latin America. So. Uh, and, to, and of course to the whole world. So I certainly hope that he, that he will be remembered. We certainly in Mexico are going to remember him and to praise him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, Elena Poniatowska will be signing copies of Leonora. That is the only book we have here, I'm afraid. <clears throat> there are many others you should seek out, but if you'd like a signed copy, please do buy one here and ask her to do so. Um, thank you all very much for coming. And Elena, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you.